importance of the circle and the triangle and how I see it connects to identity. Um, so having the ability to activate the, um, something's wrong with my screen, hey, there we go. Having the ability to activate the how, so honesty, open-mindedness and willingness in our lives creates a shift inside of us. I really can't explain it to you, but uh, the miracle that's promised in the big book, the miracle that's now in me, the miracle found in the fourth dimension or the dot that's in the center of the triangle is indescribable. Being honest about our compulsive behaviors, about how we act and react to the people around us is simply the beginning. So ask yourself, do you lie and say things are fine when they aren't? Do you say yes when your insides are screaming no? Dishonesty keeps us blind, prideful and in captivity to self. Open-mindedness is um, needed so that we can analyze past experiences and behaviors that inform us about the world around us. So what makes us sure, you know, that everyone will hurt us? Or what makes me sure that everyone will hurt me? Why do I feel, um, you know, that when I'm happy, it's not going to last very long? What causes me to look beside me for identity and meaning? So ask yourself, are you willing to take the time to be with God? To quietly sit and, and allow him to slow your brain. Because I know that this is something that I can't do on my own power. So many hours of my life I've wasted nurturing my food uh, activities. Obsessing about the people, places, and things around me. The reality was that my lifelong fears drove my obsessing, which led to my food activities. Food was my solution for so long. And one day, it wasn't a solution anymore. And so the circle in the triangle is a symbol of life. The circle surrounds the triangle and is a representation of, I guess what's outside the circle is the representation of the whole world. Inside the circle is the world of AA. It represents serenity and perfection and unlimited potential. The triangle is a means to find the wholeness and connection to God, it represents perfect union of mind and body. So I have a disease, I'm sure you've heard, I have a disease that's threefold. A physical malady, the allergy and the craving, a mental malady, the obsession of the mind, and a spiritual malady, which is my disconnection from God. And when we combine three activities in the sides of the triangle, we find a simple, not necessarily easy, but simple process for complicated people like us. Remaining in the wholeness of the circle and the triangle is key. So when we take the base of the triangle, which is the mind obsession, when we take it through the 12 steps that are shown on page 59 and 60 of the big book, and then take our bodies to the fellowship of the meetings, which is the left side of the triangle, the spiritual awakening occurs. <clears throat> and then we can take the awakened spirit out into the world to be of service, which is the right side of the, tri of the triangle. The promise is that we will become whole and have renewed life, a renewed mind and body, a renewed connection with God, a separation from self and union with God. Thankfully, the God of my understanding yesterday last month, last year, is not the same God that I have today, that I know today. He isn't even the same God that I'll know next year, because hopefully there will be a depth in weight for which I cannot imagine yet. I stand on the promise that, you know, with a deeper intimacy between us, between me and God, that my daily reprieve will stand firm. But as a recovered compulsive eater, I'm still powerless in my mind over food. I am powerless in my body over physical craving and the disease of compulsive eating. I am powerless spiritually over this disease that ails me. For I have not arrived as some might suggest. 
if I begin to believe that I have the doors to relapse are opened and it starts in my mind, not in my body. I ask God and God alone because human aid fails me every single time and self-reliance fails me every single time. So when we rely on anything other than God, any human aid, you know, including special diets, meal plans, excessive exercising, sponsors alone, pro the program alone, meetings alone, money, anything other than God, then we're in the realm of our disease. The realm of self, self-will, where our minds scream at us. So with the circle and triangle in mind, I ask myself weekly, if not daily, am I nurturing the body or, or unity side of the triangle? Am I going to meetings? Am I going enough or too much? Am I taking care of my body with enough sleep, sound balanced meals and movement? They're not too much of any one thing, but a balance. Am I doing my daily readings and meditations? Because if not, I tend to want to skip meals and this leads me into trouble. And I ask myself, where in uh, my recovery, where am I in the recovery of, of my mind? Um, am I working the program as outlined in the big book on pages 84 to 88? Am I making amends? Am I um, improving my conscious contact with God? How am I doing this? And do I need to do more? Am I nurturing my awakened spirit with service? So am I helping others find what I have? Resting on our own laurels is an alarm bell for the addict of the hopeless variety. It's when our pride comes in and we feel we have arrived. It's when we decide that we have, you know, gone far enough and that God is simply happy with us. Resting on our own progress thus far allows the restlessness, irritability, and discontentedness to return slowly and sneakily. And I know this because page 85 of the big book tells us that our disease is a subtle foe. So I'm reminded of a story in Judges, Judges 12, 1 to 6. It's a story um, of two people, the Ammonites to the south of the uh, Jordan, and I'm probably going to say it wrong, and the Gilead people who live to the one, the, yes, one side of the Jordan. So the Ephraimites who lived, so they were quarreling, um, the Ephraimites who lived on the other side of the Jordan were upset that they weren't included in this quarrel. And they confronted Jephthah, the Gilead, and the Ephraimites were basically, you know, saying, hey, look at us, we're good, we're powerful, why were we left out? Why were we not included in this fight? And when I read this, I really related because I too have allowed selfishness, self-centeredness, and self-seeking to cause me to confront many people. I would puff my chest and I said, you know, what about me? I took my cues from who I, about who I was, from how I perceived others saw me. I held expectations of others to fulfill me. And so I was often in turmoil. What are they thinking? What did I say? I mean, the conversations that were in my head screamed at me. And I learned in my resentment inventory, and then later on uh, doing amends, that many of the people that I felt that I had to make amends to had no idea what I was even talking about. And what this tells me is that I had such a distorted sense of self and because of this distorted sense of self, uh, there was a script written and playing out in my head that actually didn't even exist. It was super exhausting. So Jephthah being, you know, a man of really, he was high strung and he had a bad temper anyway, his pride rose. You know, I mean, he was confronted and his anger turned to fury. And he used all of the power of his army against the um, Ephraimites, or Ephraimites. And 42,000 men, men fell that day. Which makes me think of how many times 
has my pride caused me to lash out at the people around me? How many bridges did I burn because of fear and overreaction to my surroundings or words spoken and mulled over in my head for days? It reminds me of how when someone in my life did not fulfill the role that I had placed on them or when someone didn't react, you know, as I had planned. Me being the director of my life, I mean, how dare they not follow the script, right? Um, you know, and then I would vow to show them and I would yell and I would tantrum and often I was driven to push, you know, harder and more times than not at the expense of others. So after that time, the men of Gilead um, patrolled the riverside. They forced everyone that they saw to identify themselves. And so the Ephraimites, Ephraimites <laughs> were forced to hide who they were or face death. And, and this was me. So like when I, when I had to go out into the world and see people, in my addiction and also abstinent, you know, I needed to identify as something else. I know for me that I was one person when I worked, another with friends, another at church, another with my son, another at school, and then another when I was alone. And I couldn't imagine actually finding a balance where I could just be me no matter where I was. And actually, I mean, all I really know is that I was uncomfortable all of the time. I had spent so much time being different people, depending on where I was, who I was with, that I really had no idea who I was at all. My identity was stuck in survivor mode. Even as a believer in Christ and abstinent from drugs for 11 years, and even when what some might count as abstinent from food, I was restless, irritable, discontented, fully abstinent and knowing God. I had been ridden with fear that the mask would fall off. I mean, surely I would die too, right? So imagine being whole, being one person, no matter where you walked and who you saw. Circle in the triangles wholeness gives us a way to understand our unique identities. The process of the steps reached me in a deeper place where I was open to see, willing to accept the possibilities and able to actually move in a fashion that might allow me to know and fulfill who God would have me be and what he would have me do. If I deny my truth and step away from the circle and triangle, I soon lose sight of my reality and who I am. I'm an addict of the hopeless variety if left to my own selfish will. My ism isn't gone, it's just eased, eased, yes. <laughs> and I have a daily reprieve and it's contingent on my activity within the circle and the triangle. It's contingent on, sorry, I have to plug my computer in. Contingent, it's contingent on my proximity to God, to Jesus. So in Matthew 26, as some of you might be familiar with, Peter denies his identity as a follower of Jesus three times. And I know that I've been aware of my disease many times and had experienced um, myself in the realm of it. But then I denied it because I received a couple days, weeks, years of relief. I, I can hide who I am with actions, works, great speech or language, weight loss even, but my true identity will eventually rear its ugly head. The circle and the triangle keeps me out of isolation, away from addictive behaviors. It keeps me in the big book doing steps 10 and 11 considerations daily. It drives me towards the closer consciousness with God that's needed for my daily reprieve. I think I can deny my identity as an addict, but in reality, it shows in my relationships and how I react to my surroundings. God has a plan and with little effort, I'll be whole. 
I will think, act, and talk differently. I become much more efficient. I looked the word efficient up and it means capable of producing the desired result with little or no waste. And the promise on page 88 is that, at page 88 of the big book is that we will become much more fruitful. Many programs ending in a focus on self will. And when you relapse, they often say that it's your fault. You didn't work the program correctly. They suggest that it's a one and done process. And I'm grateful for what BBA says, that it's a lifelong process, a continual renewing of mind. And if I'm honest about where I am, <clears throat> I am then open to assess my journey and willing to tweak the areas that need to be changed for a new experience and a new closeness with my higher power. And I, I find so much hope in this. True recovery isn't about abstinence. Um, one can be abstinent and be miserable, grumpy and short. One can be abstinent and they still have so many voices in their head. The doubt, the thoughts that tell me, you know, that I'm not doing enough, being enough, giving enough. There's a change that occurs in us while working the steps. And engaging in the fullness of the circle and the triangle. It's nothing that we can will ourselves to do. Recovery isn't about will because we don't have the power. And I found this to be true. Abstinence looks different for everyone. So food abstinence may not be as cut and dry as say, I don't know, porn, drugs, or alcohol, you know, where you might be able to stay away from those activities or substances. Food isn't my problem. God calmed me from the inside out. I had years of abstinence and still experienced physical cravings with the voices of the mental obsession screaming at me in my head. The restlessness, restlessness, irritability, and discontentment was all part of my character while being abstinent because spiritually I was dying. I just couldn't see it. I heard someone say in, um, in a podcast that I, I've listened to lately, that Mickey Bush, an AA old timer said, so um, you're abstinent? Well, so too is the cat. And, and so if, if the cat can be a sane eater, then what's so special about being abstinent? And my point is that we can live insanely on the inside and outwardly be abstinent. So we look as if we are fully functioning and managing, but inside, again, the loud clamor of voices. And by the time I act out with food, I have, I'm already deep in the depth of my addiction. The eating is the final stage. It's not the beginning. And so as Peter and the Ephraimites found out, we can run, but we can't hide from who we are in our addiction, at least not for very long we can mask ourselves, you know, like those filters that they have now on, you know, Instagram or TikTok or other social medias. So, um, you know, once you become confident, though, using those filters, you become comfortable, you forget, you become relaxed, and, and your posture, the posture, sorry, that's needed to uphold that facade, that, that filter, uh, wavers and flicks. Not sure if you understand that, what I'm talking about, but those filters, you have to like hold your camera in exactly the right way and have your head in exactly the right angle or else the, the filter flickers off and then there's just you left there. Well, that's kind of like what I think it's like. People around you, the ones closest, the ones you live with, those are the ones who will see. And I think looking back on my journey, that's the beauty of it. I mean, if we can't see the problem, how can we do anything about it, right? I know that I needed my problem to be pointed out many times. I mean, how many times did I fall prey to compliments of someone saying how visually well I looked, how well I had handled school and was striving for a different life, such a new person I'd become, 
you know, they commented on my weight loss and, and how nicely my shirts and clothes hung on me, how good it felt to see that 0.5 of a pound leave the scale tally in my weekly weigh-ins. How much had I made food and controlling it my God and my comfort? How many times did I make people and how I thought they saw me, my identity? My defects, my delusions, my long life of certain beliefs of how I was sure the world around me was and how I expected the world to be, how I needed to set everything up and react to it instead of interact with the world around me. Control. My addiction was about self and making me okay. And I looked sideways to find my identity. I know what it feels like and looks like to be blocked from God. The wholeness of the circle and the triangle gives us identity in Christ, an identity that we can understand. Identity that I feel I can actually feel applies to me. An identity that feels attainable for the first time. First Corinthians says, join to the Lord, we become one spirit with him. A new identity. It's a new creation as in Second Corinthians 5. The wholeness of the circle and triangle enables us to see and be who God wants us to be. And honestly, it happens with little to no effort. Identity isn't something that I seek to determine anymore. It just is. And that's what I have. Thank you, everyone.